On Thursday evening, Tucker Carlson broke the internet. In this video, we are going to break down 10 fact checks on the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview, and we're going to talk where we stand. What's next for Russia, Ukraine? What's an analysis that we could take away after Tucker Carlson's interview? We're going to do that right now. First, I wanna just thank you. On Thursday evening, we had 150,000 folks watching my commentary of Tucker Carlson's interview live at the same time. This was incredible. That commentary video got over 1.3 million views with a 22 minute summary video thereafter getting over half a million views, all in the span of about 36 hours. And that is a huge thank you to all of y'all. So if you're a new subscriber here, Welcome. I do my best to be as neutral as possible, and even if I don't get everything right the first time, I try my best to fix it later on. The goal here is to be neutral. So, let's get into it. Fact check number one, or maybe point number one, because I don't think anybody disputes this one. The media, the mainstream media, absolutely hated Tucker Carlson's interview with Vladimir Putin. Almost every single media outlet that discussed the interview was very upset at Tucker. We'll talk about why in just a moment, but listen to some of these quotes. Politico said, Tucker aligned himself with the enemy. That Carlson lied that the Western media had not even bothered to try to speak with Putin, and that he's just a useful idiot. Al Jazeera says Carlson didn't pressure Putin the way he used to sandbag on pro-democratic guests on Fox News. He didn't even try to refute Putin's outlandish and ungrounded claims. Tucker goddamned Carlson served a very well microphone stand for the crazy maniac who for two hours rambled about how he loved to kill Ukrainians. Can we just take a quick pause there? I didn't hear that from Putin, N neither did I really align with any of these quotes I've seen so far because I, I didn't so far hear any kind of real refutation of what Tucker or Putin said. There's been a lot of this backlash without actual real analysis and commentary. I mean, consider this, Chris Wallace claims that Carlson did not interview Putin. Carlson just sat there as an eager puppet. He cashed in on a Putin and asked nothing about invading a sovereign country, the innocent lives lost, war crimes, or anything. Calling him a useful idiot is an insult to useful idiots. The New York Times says Carlson's interview with Putin is a two-hour marathon of delusions and fakes. It also Almost no fact-checking, at least that I could easily find. Frankly, as an interviewer myself, uh, since I interview folks like whether it's uh, Peter Schiff or Kevin O'Leary or Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank or my interview with Patrick McDavid, you name it. As an interviewer myself, there is a real risk of offending the person you're interviewing to a substantial degree to where they kick you out, they cancel your interview, they take your tapes, they ruin the potential of you ever interviewing anybody else. They prevent the, fl it basically in, in such a case, you would really prevent your interview from being heard by consumers at all. And so in other words, if in an interview, you're way too aggressive, you're basically saying, hey, nobody like this person should ever come on the channel again. And the free flow of ideas stops. See, usually what I like to do when I interview somebody is interview somebody and then analyze afterwards. What do we think? Do we agree with this? Do we disagree with this? Let's have commentary on things afterwards. But to debate and prevent the free flow of opinions in an interview, when it's an interview and not a debate, usually doesn't go very well. Consider, for example, when a BBC reporter famously interviewed Elon Musk while trying to confront Elon Musk and turning it into a debate. Elon Musk turned around and suggested that the reporter was simply a liar and none of the other parts of the interview ever became memorable. I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con uh, content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed... You just lied. What, no, no, what I claimed was... Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my feed or not, 
I mean, I, right, and Literally if you, you look at someone one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U in the UK. So there is a real risk to actually alienating your audience when you're trying to let somebody your interview share their flu free flow of ideas. By debating somebody solely in an interview, what you're basically doing is you're robbing your audience of the ability to make their own decision. And see, this is why I like fact checking things afterwards. Let them talk, let them have their free flow of thought and fact check afterwards. For example, I looked at Boris Johnson's fact check because he wrote a fact check in the Daily Mail. And I'll tell you, most of it revolved around Tucker Carlson's interview was a tissue of lies. He betrayed his viewers and listeners around the world. Tucker was just a sewer for Putin's message. Why not a point by point breakdown of where things were right and where things are wrong? We didn't really get that from Boris Johnson. Around the world, people are watching that ludicrous interview with Vladimir Putin conducted by Tucker Carlson. And we must not fall for this tissue of lies above all for the notion that Putin is somehow fated to succeed in Ukraine. On the contrary, he is doomed to fail. Read about it in the Daily Mail. All we got is, well, what Putin said is a lie. Okay, well, why is it a lie? Where's the evidence that it's a lie? Remember, Putin specifically called out Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson was implicated by Putin as being the person who killed the deal Ukraine and Russia were going to sign as a negotiated settlement in Istanbul. Boris Johnson's response was, he lied barefacedly about his intention to invade Ukraine. He lied about the ending of the settlement. And that's really it. We didn't really actually get evidence. You could read the piece yourself. It's in the Daily Mail. It's literally written by Boris Johnson. John Kirby says, well, look, this is from the White House, right? One of the communications directors. There's bipartisan support for Ukraine. Don't take at face value what Putin says. Why? Senate leaders, keep in mind, uh, Senate leaders did just fail to lock in another $7.9 billion amendment for Ukraine. So that's per punch bowl as of today. So I'm, I'm not sure if there actually is bipartisan support right now, but okay. Uh, and uh, I did think it was very interesting that in 2019, you had Donald Trump encourage Zelensky to work things out with Putin. This is on video. I posted the links to a lot of this research and that video with Trump on ehack.com. And I really hope that Russia, because I really believe that President Putin would like to do something. I really hope that you and President Putin get together and can solve your problem. That would be a tremendous achievement. And I know you're trying to do that. President Look, it's possible that I failed. Maybe I missed where the mainstream media really wanted to break down this interview fact by fact. But the reality is, I spent about six hours just this morning all solely looking at media fact checks. And the vast majority of clips and quotes were simply, Putin's a liar. Why? Here's a second fact check where Politico is arguing Tucker Carlson is a liar. Tucker Carlson is a liar, Politico says, because Tucker says, it's not that America was going to launch a surprise attack on Russia. I didn't say that. And then Politico's like, well, Tucker, you're a liar because Putin says America was going to do that. Okay, so what does Putin say? Well, Putin says, quote, we know who the main adversary for the U.S. and NATO is. It's Russia. And Ukraine will serve as the advanced foothold for such an attack. Okay, but wait a second. Let's parse this. Ukraine being a foothold does not necessarily mean the United States is going to conduct a surprise attack. There can be something known as a preemptive strike, which is, okay, let's say Russia starts moving tanks to the border where America is and they conduct a preemptive strike, but nobody's suggesting that America was going to surprise attack Russia. Now keep this in mind for a moment, okay, where we're going with this. So Putin's not saying that. Putin's not saying that America was going to surprise attack Russia. Putin's not saying that, uh, or, or Tucker Carlson's not saying that America's going to surprise attack Russia. And Politico's like, you guys said America was gonna surprise attack them, that's not true. And I'm like, that's not what they said. So I wanted to clarify that. Number three, the NATO expansion. Okay, this one is really disputed. This is a tough one. NATO expansion, 
Oh boy, this one gets very heated. So let's just try to keep this as neutral as possible. According to F France 24, they did a uh, French piece on this. It's translated from French in 1990. I've got these all linked at ehack.com so you can see all my evidence. U.S. Secretary of State James Baker made to former Soviet leader Gorbachev during a meeting on February 9th, 1990, an agreement that NATO would not expand past the territory of East Germany, a promise that was then repeated by NATO's general secretary on a speech May 17th, 1990, that same year in Brussels. Okay, so we have this, this argument that Gorbachev was made a deal that NATO would not expand east. And that was echoed by NATO's general secretary in a speech on May 17th, 1990. It's a long time ago. This is like 34 years ago. 1991, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg was asked by Der Spiegel about NATO expansion and if they promised not to expand eastward. So about a year later. And what does the NATO General Secretary say? That simply isn't true. Such a promise was never made. There was never such a backroom deal. It's simply wrong. Hmm. What happened after that? Well, in 1990, NATO accepted the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland. In 2004, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia. In 2009, Albania, Croatia. In 2017, Montenegro. And in 2020, North Macedonia. So as you can see, we've certainly moved eastward. Now, you have folks on both sides of the aisle who say, well, we never made a deal because look at Jens saying we never made a deal. And then you have other people quoting 1990 saying, wait, but you guys did make a deal. So basically people on both sides are using different parts of history. And clearly whether a deal was made, it was pretty much unmade very quickly. This is highly disputed. NATO claims it never promised it would not expand East. NATO actually quotes Gorbachev, the same person that France 24 said was in agreement with no eastward expansion. But in 2014, so 14 years later, Gorbachev says in an interview, the topic of NATO expansion was not discussed at all, and it wasn't brought up in any of those years. I say that with full responsibility. Not a single Eastern European country raised the issue, not even after the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist in 1991. Western leaders didn't bring it up either. So on both sides, you have this giant potential misunderstanding that unfortunately has been going on forever. Now, I will give NATO uh, a, a, an argument here. When people say NATO is trying to encircle Russia, NATO has a really good point when they say, hey, this is how much of Russia we've encircled. The little orange line at the top left and the tiny little bit at the top right. That's it. I'll, I'll remove myself at the bottom. I mean, that's that's a pretty, pretty solid counter argument. It's still potentially NATO. Well, it is NATO right on Russia's border, which obviously unsettles Russia and Putin. But it's worth knowing that detail. Uh, next, the Minsk agreements. OK, these are really disputed as well. So remember that these are a series of agreements that started in 2014, Minsk 1, 2014. And then a little later in 2014, we had Minsk 2. These were ceasefire and monitoring agreements. Some people suggest that the Minsk agreement were never meant to be followed by Ukraine anyway, that they were just a tool to buy time. So basically, Ukraine wants to buy time, so they commit to the Minsk agreements. And Russia's kind of like, hey, right, Ukraine, and Putin just said this in an interview, Ukraine, you're not implementing the Minsk accords, why, why not? And Ukraine's like, well, we're not implementing them because you're not implementing them. And then you have Merkel's phone call, which just added fuel to this fire. Merkel, in a call with pranksters, where somebody pre pretended to be a president, and, and Merkel fell for it, uh, said that the Minsk agreement bought Ukraine valuable time. Oh, this just adds complexity. Because now you have folks on one side of the aisle who say, oh, so Ukraine never actually wanted to fulfill the deal. And then you have people on the other side who say, no, it's true a ceasefire buys a country time to rebuild. But then you have people who counter that and go, rebuild for what? Rebuild your weaponry? Rebuild your, your, your defenses and fortify? 
So you can see how muddy this gets really quickly. So this one is very clearly disputed. And that's a lot of the problem of what's going on here is the issue between Russia and Ukraine. It's not clear cut. If it was clear cut, it'd probably, it'd probably be a lot easier to solve, but it's very disputed. And both sides never actually made things crystal clear, whether on purpose because they never had the true intention of following through with them on both sides, right? Or that's just the way things played out. Who knows? Now, there was a claim that it was disgusting for Putin to claim that Poles collaborated with Nazis. That would never be true. Well, actually, it is possible that both could be true, that Poles did not collaborate with Nazis and that Poles did present and collaborate with Nazis. See, Poland currently presents itself as a noble victim during World War II, and Poland did suffer. In fact, half of all Jews who died during World War II died on Polish land. Poles resisted Nazi occupation. Some Poles helped hide their Jewish neighbors. The collaboration point of view comes from the fact that eventually you get individuals in Poland who recognize the Nazis have taken over and you could either collaborate or die. In other words, somebody comes to your house with a gun and says, where are the Jews hiding? You get caught hiding, you're dead. Your family's dead, your wife is dead, your husband's dead, your children are dead. Or people do this during war, they're over there. This is horrible. It's horrible, right? That would be a form of collaboration to, so to speak, save yourself. So the reality is probably both are true. There are probably people who did collaborate with the Nazis. And there are probably people who would rather die than collaborate with the Nazis. So the odds are both are probably true. Poland today makes it a crime to say that anyone in Poland collaborated with the Nazis. So it's clearly very touchy. Now, another fact check. This one comes down to semantics. So Politico argued that there was a decree banning negotiations with Putin. Politico says the president of Ukraine has legislated a ban on negotiating with Russia. Putin, or, or rather Politico, calls this a lie because the, the ban is actually on negotiating with Putin, not with Russia. Okay, so basically they're saying Putin is lying because there's a ban on negotiating with Russia, but the ban isn't actually with Russia, it's with Putin. Point of this is, this is semantics. Putin is the president of Russia. If someone said negotiations are banned with Biden, like Biden or not, negotiations with the US would probably be dead as well. So this is semantics. And I thought this was a really weak, like argument to try to get out there and fact check Putin on. Putin saying, oh yeah, you know, they banned people from negotiating with us. Collectively, for the purpose of this conflict, Putin is Russia. Number seven, fact check. A lot of people got upset about Putin's claim to be the largest European economy on the basis of PPP, purchase power parity. Putin's actually right here. Now, PPP is really complicated to understand. I'm gonna try to make it as simple as possible. That's what I try to do on the channel. I try to keep things simple and explain them as simply as possible. All right, purchase being power parity. Basically, how much does it cost to buy a TV remote control? I'm making this totally up as an example and a cup of coffee in uh, America versus China versus Europe, let's say. Okay, and, and, and you know what, a rental car. So let's do a rental car, a remote control, and a cup of coffee, okay? Let's say in America, it costs $400, and that's gonna be our baseline. Let's say it costs $500 in Europe, and let's say it costs $200 in China. Well, in China, it costs half as much as the US. In Europe, it costs 25% more. So now what you could do is you can divide a country's GDP by a weighting factor. So in other words, if China's GDP is $13 trillion, on a PPP basis, because everything's half as expensive, you actually divide their GDP by 0.5, which makes their GDP look twice as big. Whereas in Europe, you divide by 1.25, it's a weighting factor. You're trying to put everything into dollars to weight it all the same, which actually makes, let's say Germany's economy, for example, look smaller and Russia's look larger. So is it true? Yes. 
on a PPP basis, not you know the Paycheck Protection Program, on a purchasing power parity basis, yes, Europe is the largest economy in, well, sorry, Russia is the largest economy in Europe. However, remember, it can be very, very inaccurate because it's not that easy to calculate the cost of a basket of goods in all these different countries and then adjust them. Uh, it, it is also complex because usually these adjustments don't account for uh, the costs of actually trying to buy these things, the tariffs, the taxes, supply and demand factors. So there's so much adjusting to do. It's, just, it's not a good measure. And so we could agree that purchasing power parity is, is probably a little bit of a bad comparison. But if we are going to use it, Putin is correct. Number eight. Why did the USSR collapse? So Politico says that the USSR collapsed because of economic and internal political struggles. And they complained that Putin said the collapse was initiated by Russian leadership. Again, I feel like we're trying to like grasp at straws to call Putin a liar here. Both can be true. It can be true that Russian leadership was actually the reason there were internal political struggles and economic issues. Political countered claims of Putin's argument that the U.S. controls the world's media. Political argues media are privately owned. Yes, most media are privately owned in America, though, let's be real. The Twitter files have made it, or at least created substantial doubt in the independence of the mainstream media. This does not make all journalists bad. This does not make all media companies bad. However, Putin hits on American doubts. He's twisting the knife in a wound of suspicion. And Americans have the right to be suspicious. In fact, everybody around the world has the right to be suspicious of what they're being told. This is why it's nice to hear the opposite point of view. Everybody has their own prop propaganda, but at least if you are provided both sets of propaganda, at least you have a little bit more ammunition to see where the differences truly lay. Now, Russell Brand goes on a rant that's, I shouldn't maybe call it a rant, but let's just say he has a, a somewhat simplistic approach of the U.S. just wants more money for the military industrial complex. That's why we're going to keep this going, which Putin hit on as well. And Russell Brand is probably correct. The military industrial complex is very, very powerful. And many people in America are frustrated that we keep spending money for bombs and weapons for other countries. Look at the amount of money we've given Israel. And now folks are scratching their head going, wait, 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 wait. We're asking you not to invade Rafa city. Egypt is putting their military on high alert on the border of Rafa city because that's right on the border with Egypt. And now y'all want to invade Rafa city where you've got a bunch of uh, refugees essentially. And Israel's like, well, we got to fully eliminate Hamas. So uh, at some point you wonder, like, if you keep supporting the supplying of weapons, are you financing people's other wars to where maybe their, their ability to make decisions could be skewed by the fact that you don't actually have to open your wallet? You know, if somebody's like carte blanche, you know, here's as much money as you need for bombs and weapons. It's probably a lot easier to make the decision to invade somewhere or not. Whereas if you actually have to cut the check yourself, you actually have to start weighing things like, okay, do we invade here or do we invade there, right? You, you have to pick, you can't pick everything. But if somebody else is paying for everything, it's easier to just go, I'll just keep going, <laughs> right? So uh, again, this, this isn't like an argument for or against Israel. It's just saying, yes, this is, this is a fair argument from Russell Brand, yes. And people are very frustrated in America about the military industrial complex, the funding of wars around the world. Could we instead use that money to focus on our own needs? Now, of course, we have to balance this because other people say, hey, well, you know, it's the reason uh, America is deemed to be as safe as it is. You know, the reason for it is because of the military industrial complex. They're keeping us safe. You know, this is obviously where debates can be had about the military industrial complex. Take a shot every time I just said that phrase. So anyway, I wanted to give a little bit of that. Uh, it, is, uh, it is something that has been the core of many videos, mostly because I think it's, it, that, that is a pain point for a lot of Americans. If you go to Americans and you're like, should we keep funding you know, bombs in other countries? It's very popular for people to say, hell no, spend the money here in America. And there are a lot of problems America needs help with. I ran for governor in California to try to work to solve those. Zelensky's father, 
point ten. Zelensky's father, it, it, uh, Putin was wrong about this. When Putin suggested that Zelensky's father fought in World War II, it was actually his grandfather. Zelensky's father was born in 1947, so that's after the war. However, Zelensky's grandfather did fight in World War II. However, he was an awarded comrade. He fought for the Soviet Union, not the Nazis. So something to keep in mind. Uh, some other things that really aren't up for dispute. Uh, it is true that the Soviet Union did try to join NATO before the Warsaw Pact between, you know, the, the Russian side and, and various countries was signed before the Warsaw Pact collapsed. And then those, a lot of those countries ended up joining NATO. NATO rejected Russia, citing a lack of democratic and defensive aims in Russia. So yes, that, that did happen. Uh, some folks uh, are picking up on uh, Putin claiming that Ukrainians and Russians are one. This is probably false. You're probably not going to see a clear unity between the two populations anymore. I mean, you can go all the way back to 2001, where Yurak conducted a, a poll, uh, and we know polls can be misleading as well, but 67.5% uh, of Ukraine's population declared themselves as Ukrainian and uh, chose Ukrainian as their native language. 29.6% declared it Russian. Most of the time you're seeing their primary language uh, being Russian on, on the Eastern flanks, which makes sense. Uh, and as far as like nationality or ethnic origin, overall 77.8% of Ukraine's population self-identified ethnically as Ukrainian with 17.3% identifying ethnically as Russian. Something else, and, and again, take these for what they are. At this point, I think things are so different between Ukraine and Russia, you're probably not going to fully assimilate. assimilate. But yeah, you do need to come up with some kind of resolution because the constant war is just ridiculous. Uh, something else that we got out of this is, frankly, Putin's health. Putin's, the, the fact that Putin is dead is clearly not true, that he has these massive ailments and is incapable of leading probably aren't true. So it's nice to kind of put some of those conspiracies to rest. I mean, I suppose he could still have cancer. You can't really tell, but anyway. Uh, Canadian, uh, or uh, Justin Trudeau respond to the uh, Nazi uh, argument. Oh, that's the argument that why did you invite a Schutzstaffel officer? to parliament and give him a standing ovation. This was a big scandal, a big faux pas in Canada. And Justin Trudeau basically said, the invasion of Ukraine was unjust. No response at all to the question. So punted the question. This is what, why I get frustrated about the lack of like fact checking. Like if the, the mainstream media is supposed to be so, so good, where, where are the real fact checks? Why can't somebody go, thanks for giving us the perspective? I don't know. So where do we stand now? Well, in my opinion, Ukraine will likely rely on IMF loans and budget cuts to fund its defense as progress to fund Ukraine is stalled in Congress and probably will be until at least January of 2025. And that would be the end of January 2025 anyway. The interview will spotlight, uh, you know, well, I, I think the interview spotlights uh, talk of resolutions for Russia, Ukraine. And uh, this is good. We want people talking about negotiating this and ending this war. In fact, Putin invited for negotiation. The problem is what Putin said in terms of negotiation was blurry. There are some folks who listened to the speech uh, from Putin or the interview from Putin. It was somewhat a speech, given that most of it was Putin talking. Some people listened to the direct Russian translation and uh, said that our translation wasn't as good as what Putin actually said. See, our translation is, what's there to work out? If you want to stop fighting, stop supplying weapons. Then it'll be over in a few weeks. Then we can negotiate, which is basically saying, Let's mop up Ukraine when they don't get supplied weapons and then we can negotiate. That's the way it came through in English. However, people who listen to it in Russian say that's not exactly what Putin meant, suggesting that Putin is actually much more open to compromise because obviously the English translation is not very negotiable. So the reality though is both sides have dug in. Putin has dug in, Biden's dug in, Putin's doing the, well, they can call me, it's their fault. And Biden's doing, he can call us, it's his fault. It's like, it's like fifth graders fighting. It's frankly ridiculous. It's a stalemate of stubbornness. People need to wake up and get their leaders to actually get on the phone, stop being little weenie babies and start actually negotiating in earnest. Why not advertise these things that you told us here? I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take.